If you have missed any sermon in this series, we are talking about hard times. You face hard times. I face hard times. Allow me to catch you up for a moment. We began by saying, when you lack what you need. When you lack what you need, you need to think that possibly the thing that I need, the greatest need I have in my life is God himself. Then Pastor Johannes helped us to understand that when you can't defend yourself, God can defend you. And then last week we contemplated something that sometimes we see good people do bad. But I want you to understand that when evil is in your heart or when evil is in the heart of somebody else, God's grace <laughs> is bigger than your evil. Should have been an amen, but that's all right. <clears throat> Today our topic is when you don't get what you deserve. Sometimes it seems as if we don't have what we deserve. Uh, you are working hard for that job, but you're not getting the pay that you need. You're working hard at that exercise plan, but the weight is not going off. Uh, sometimes we don't get what we deserve. In Psalm 37, uh, David is reflecting on this very particular issue. He's asking himself, oh, how come I don't get what I deserve? I am faithful to God. I do the right thing. But I don't have what I deserve. And I think that we owe uh, David an audience to listen to him. Tell us what should we do when we don't get what we deserve. Psalm 37 verses 1 to 8. Please turn there in your Bibles or in your mobile phones. And, and flip and slide if you need to go on on, 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 on Bible Hub and Bible Study Tools. That, that's all right with me. But turn your Bibles, Sister Timmy, to Psalm 37 and verse number 1 to number 8. And you, when you have it, kindly stand for the reading of the scripture. Because I believe that before we go into a sermonic journey, we need to have the scriptures as the car to take us on our sermonic highway. Because when the scriptures drive the sermonic highway... Then we're going to really be blessed and we're going to see what God is trying to tell us. Uh, Psalm 37, you have that? If you have it, kindly stand for the reading of the text. Psalm 37. And we look, we're looking at verse number 1 to number 8. When you have it, say amen. 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 Verse number 1, David uh, talking... Do not fret because of evil doers. No, be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the herb, as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord. And he, listen to this brothers and sisters. He shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. And he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light. And your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord. Hmm. Rest in the Lord on Sabbath. Rest in the Lord. And wait patiently for him. Do not fret. Once again, do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. Because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Hear this. Seize from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret the third time. It only causes harm. For evil doers shall be cut off. But those who wait on the Lord. Sister Cardica. Those who wait on the Lord. They shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while. And the wicked shall be no more. Indeed you will look carefully for his place. But it shall be no more. When you don't get what you deserve. Tell your neighbor when I don't get what I deserve. 
And then ask him, are you getting what you deserve? Let us pray. Father, I pray that you inhabit my mind and my vocal machine and everything about me so that when I do this task, it is you who is speaking and not me. I pray for your brother and your sister who needs to hear this word, that you may speak to them, give them alertness and focus. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Listen to these startling facts, Sister Kartika. On average, a woman earns 80.5 cents for every dollar a man earns. Listen carefully. On average, elementary school teachers in the U.S. make 70, 67 percent of what college-educated workers in other professions earn. Listen, church, four states, Iowa, Delaware, Mississippi, and Vermont, have never sent a woman to the Senate or the House. You're not listening, church. Listen to this. Blacks make up 30% of the U.S. population, but they make up 60% of the population of everyone who is incarcerated or imprisoned. Doesn't it feel like that sometimes life doesn't give you what you deserve? These stats show that sometimes the reality of the moment is that we are not getting what we deserve. Like I said at the beginning, you are working hard, busting your tail, coming early, live late, but you're not getting the promotion. You feel like uh, you are like that security guard who... Uh, people pass by, they don't even say thank you for opening the door. You feel like uh, the third wheel on a date. You have never received appreciation for the fact that you always report to the boss on time. Doesn't it feel that sometimes? That sometimes you are not getting what you deserve. Uh, certainly David felt it. And that is why David begins by saying... Do not fret yourself because he understands that when people don't get what they deserve, the resulting emotion, the resulting feeling is to fret. Pastor, I don't understand what is to fret. Basically, to fret is to get angry. And if you look at the text, Psalm 37, three times, at T God times, how many times? I don't hear you. How many times? Three times David says, do not fret. Do not fret. It cease from anger. Do not be envious because David understands when you see your friend who doesn't work hard at all get the promotion that you deserve, guess what happens in your heart? Anger happens. A friend of mine, he went... Uh, in his country, he just finished his degree. He's, he has a master's degree from a well-known institution. He has a master's in the Old Testament. Very educated. He goes to his home country. He goes to the conference. Conference is uh, a church leadership in, in the Seventh-day Adventist church. He goes to the leadership and he says, here I am to serve. He has a master's degree in the Old Testament. Here I am to serve. And so he talks to the leaders and he says, and the leaders tell him, okay, you want to serve? We have a group of gospel workers. Please join them and serve with them. And this brother of mine, my buddy, my friend, he goes out there busting his behind, knocking on doors, Telling people about Jesus. Jesus is coming soon. Hallelujah. He preaches. He teaches. He prays. Bible studies. Busting himself in the heat in the African sun. Getting darker than me. <laughs> 
And so after the mission, all of these gospel workers, these people who are talking about Jesus were called by the leadership. And the leadership called everyone one by one into a room. And so a person will come into the room, they will walk out of the room and they are smiling because they have compensation. They have been paid for the work that they have done. And so my friend is waiting to be called. He wasn't called. And then an old worker is passing by, sees my friend sitting down, and he looks at my friend. He says, hey, uh, how, how much money did you get? And my friend is looking at this old worker, and he says, look, I, I have nothing. No, nah, the old worker says, no, nah, no, nah, it's, 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 it cannot be. So this old worker, uh, Sister Cardica, goes back into the office. So I'm picking on you a lot. He just, I'm just, you know what I mean? But he goes into the office. He talks to the church leadership, and then the, the, the leaders calls my friend into the room, and my friend was paid. He wasn't paid the full amount. He was given one-third of the amount. I don't know what's more upsetting. The fact that he wasn't called in the first place, or the fact that he was given a third of the amount. My brother and my sister, it is true. We should get mad when well, the, the, the emotion to get mad and to get angry is not only natural when you, have do, when you have done your best. Uh, but David seems to go against that emotion. And he says, do not fret. Don't be angry. Don't get mad. Pastor, God, no, I don't understand. Break it down to me. Why should I not be angry? Because David understood something. Hear me carefully. The English uh, translators chose the word fret because it makes a very important point. And don't miss me here. Uh, imagine that you have a rope in a, in a well. Are you understand what I'm saying? And so you are drawing water from the well. You know what I mean? To drink, to cook, to clean your house, whatever it is. And you have been using this uh, rope over the years. Are you understand what I'm saying? You're using it, you're using it. What is happening to the rope as it is going against the wall of the well? What is happening? It is fraying. It is wearing out. And over time, because it has worn out, it is going to break. And so that is what it means to fret. When you are fretting, you are wearing yourself out. You are taking life out of yourself. Uh, you are killing yourself. You are losing a vitality. He, and let me ask you a question. Which one of you, by being sad and, and angry because you missed a promotion, you, 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 you were helpful to that girl, you did everything, but your friend gets her, Pastor Johannes. You, you did everything possible, but you don't get it. Which one of you worrying about that is going to add a height to, them, to, to, uh, add height to themselves? Are you going to get any taller? By worrying about that situation? Are you going to get any fitter by being angry? Are you understand what I'm saying? So David understands. He says, look, if you're fretting and you're worried about the fact that somebody else is getting a promotion, the only person you are hurting is yourself. The only person who is being wounded is you, yourself, and you, nobody else. Now hear me carefully, my brother and my sister. I want you to understand that David understood, and he's not coming. You know how it is sometimes. Pastors, you meet them. You say, Pastor, I'm having a hard time. Things are not working. And then the pastor uses a spiritual band-aid to cover up your pain. I will pray for you. David is not using a spiritual bandit when he says, do not fret. David understands that it is your right to be angry. It is natural to be angry. In fact, hear me carefully. I want you to see something that is powerful. He talks about Asaph in Psalm 73. The Bible says about Asaph. This is what Asaph says. Asaph was a choir leader, Sister Lovely. A, a, the music leader, the director of the temple. This is a, a person who loves God. But listen to what they are saying because they are not getting what they deserve. Listen to this carefully, my brother, my sister. Psalm 73. Asaph says, For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He was envious. Natural. 
This is a choir leader, a person who is dedicated to God. For their, he, listen to this. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. They are not plagued like other men. He's saying like this. When I look at these people that are prospering, they have money. They have no debt. When they, when they die, they are buried in the best uh, cemeteries. They, they have no problem with health insurance. They don't need to calculate the pennies. They go on vacation and they can enjoy everything. And so Asaph is saying, when I look at people going through that, I am angry. I am envious. Because they don't love God. I love God. I sing in church. I'm writing psalms in the Bible. I'm doing the right thing. They're not doing the right thing, but me doing the right thing is not working out. Notice what Asaph continues to say. He says in verse 70, uh, Psalm 73, verse 13, he says this. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. He's basically saying like this. You know what? This serving God thing is useless. It, it's, it's, it's pointless for me to go to church and be leading out in service because I'm not getting what I deserve. I am up here doing the best thing, but God is not giving me. So having a relationship with God is pointless. Does somebody ever feel like that? People tell you, you are a Christian. How come you're struggling? You believe in God? How come your father died of cancer? You believe in God? How come you are not getting promoted? You believe in God? How come your health is failing? Tell me something is wrong with that. I drink, I smoke, and look at me. I am healthy, homey, and happy. You, sad, sad, and sadder. Me, <laughs> I got it going on here. In fact, I don't need to study, but I'll get that A. Hasn't that happened to you? You go to class, you have busted yourself, you have studied hard. <laughs> you know what I mean? And your friend comes to class, he hasn't studied, he has been partying all night. He comes to class that day, the teacher gives the exam, he becomes peeping Tom. You understand? Know peeping Tom. He's looking at everybody else's answers and he's answering. And when you get the results at the end of the, the marking period, he has an A plus, you have a B minus. Man, that's angry. I would get mad. I've had that happen to me. Hey, bro, you, you studied too much. A friend, a friend of mine told me that. Man, you, you're too much into this heat. Man, me, in fact, I don't, I don't bust my butt the night before the exam. I just go to sleep. What? That's what my friend told me, Dickie. It's the truth. Then how did you get an A+. Plus? I didn't get an A+, plus, my friend did. Oh. So well, how much you got? I worked hard, and I got an A-. minus. You know what I'm saying? So I was angry because of what my friend is going through. And that's sometimes, honestly, it's really frustrating, especially when you are in the right relationship with God. But here's what Asaph says. Here's what Asaph says. He says this, I was ignorant until I saw what is going to happen to the righteous, to the wicked. I was ignorant until I saw what God is going to do. And here, let me break it to you, my brother, my sister, Elder Henry. Let me break this down to you. Do not get it twisted. The fact that you are faithful to God does not equal prosperity. What? Pastor, that's not true. You are telling me that the fact that I give my tithe, I'm committed to God, I'm not going to prosper? I'm telling you right there, right there. That's what I need you to understand. That the fact that you're faithful to God may not always equal being prosperous. Talk to Job. The brother was faithful, but he lost everything. Jesus Christ, he never stole his brother's shirt. He never slapped any of his brothers. He never said a bad word. But he got death on a tree. So don't tell me. That the fact that I'm faithful to God, I should be prosperous. It doesn't work that way. Does God want you to prosper? Yes, he does. But let's not get it twisted. And let's not be ignorant about this. Faithfulness to God and prosperity and getting what we deserve are not always equal. They're not on the same plane. Because you have seen it. The brother doesn't worship God, but he has all the money in the world. You worship God, you don't have the money in the world. What's wrong? What's wrong? What was happening? 
what's the problem here, Lord? Help me to understand it. Because I've been taught, this prosperity preachers, give $500 and the Lord is going to bless you. Your business is going to boom. Oh, your health is going to go up here. You give the $500, yet the pastor is driving and is, is, is flying in a private jet, but you are using an anchor. There's something wrong right there. Is something wrong with the relationship with God? Is something wrong with God? What, what's, what's happening? I want you to understand something. That the good news is this. The fact that you are going through struggle and challenges. And the fact that you are not getting what you deserve. Is good news. That is the good news of the gospel. Pastor what, 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 what do you mean? You mean me not getting what I deserve is a good thing? I'm saying that it is a good thing. Pastor break it down. I'm going to do that in a moment. You need to understand something. Hear me carefully. You need to understand that when you're, when you're not getting what you deserve, the good news is you need to embrace what I call the distant look. Repeat after me. The distant look. You see, the distant look is to time travel into the future. It's to be able to see this moment not as this moment, but this moment as what that moment is going to look like in the future. Allow me to, to help you to understand what I'm trying to talk about. And so David talks about the distant look in verses number 2 and number 9 of Psalm 37. Let's go back to that text. This is what David says. Listen to this. The distant look. He says this. For evildoers shall be cut off, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. David saw. That the people who are getting what they don't deserve and me not getting what I deserve, those people, God is going to deal with them sometime in the future. The distant look allows you to see that, look, this situation is not always going to be the way it is. God, at some point in my life, at some point in this history, is going to step in and do something. Somebody say amen. You see, I want you to see something that the idea when David says they shall be cut down like the grass, it means this, that life is short. Whether you're rich or poor, each, every one of us is going to die at some point. That brother, that sister who is rolling deep in cash, swimming in the ocean of money, one day he's going to face a grave just like you. So David is saying, look at life as something that is transient, that is transitory, something that is in transit. It doesn't last forever. And so David is looking, uh, he's having a distant look. He, he is seeing, God, God has, uh, imagine this, work with me. When you have seen a movie, are you with me? Right, you've seen the movie and perhaps the scene is, is this, that the good guy is hanging on a cliff. And the evil guy is at the top of the cliff. He has his foot on his hands as he's hanging on the cliff. And, 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 and there he's struggling. You know what I'm saying? He's struggling. And, and you're there. You're watching the movie. Movie. Moving your emotions. Your, your emotions are moved. You're like, it's very tense. What is a good guy going to do at this moment? You understand what I mean? But somehow, you know how it is in the movies. He kicks his foot up and he does a, a, a somersault and he kicks the bad guy. And there he wins. You know what I mean? He comes out of the winner. And so your friend says, hey, let's see that movie. When you're watching that movie, are you going to be tense at that scene? You're not going to be tense because you've already seen how it turns out. Are you with me? And so when you have the distant look, you are not tense when you're not getting what you deserve because you know what is going to happen. You know God has already pulled the move and he says, hey, the people who are passing you over, that employer who doesn't appreciate you, that employer who's not promoting you, those co-workers who are using you, something is going to happen to them. God is going to deal with them so you are not tense. <laughs> You're, you're calm. You're cool. You're just walking. It's all right. The boss doesn't want to give me what I deserve. No problem. God, you see it, right? And God is like, I see it. Lord, my family members, they don't want to give me my inheritance. Well, Lord, you know what it is. I, I see it, my son. So when you have the distant look, <laughs> you're not worried about the present. Because you know 
what's going to happen in the future. You need to embrace the distant look. Pray, Lord, give me the distant look. Give me eyes to see beyond what I'm going through. A lot of times, my brother and my sister, we are so stuck at what, we're, what is happening that we cannot see anything else. You wake up every morning and what is on your mind is your boss, your co-worker, your family member who you are in problems with. Forget that. Allow God to let you rise above that. Somebody said, when you look at an eagle, when a storm is beating, when a storm is hitting hard, you know what an eagle does? An eagle flies higher than the storm. Amen? My prayer is, when you have the distant look, is that the distant look may help you, like an eagle, to fly higher. The storm, not getting what you deserve, is irrelevant. But God allows you to go on his wings and allows you to fly higher than the difficulty that you're facing. Hard times are going to be there. Not getting what you deserve is going to be there. Working hard is, and not getting paid is going to be there. But having the distant look allows you to go beyond that uh, situation. You see, not getting what you deserve is good news uh, because when you're not getting what you deserve, you need to embrace, embrace the uplook. Everybody say the uplook. You see, the uplook involves you turning your spiritual eye, sight, uh, to God. Pastor, break it down. I'm going to do it in, in, in a moment. Listen to this. In Psalm 37, verses 3 to, nine, to number 8. Look at your Bibles. David says, trust in the Lord. David says, delight yourself in the Lord. David says, commit your way to the Lord. David says, trust also in him. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. David is simply making one point, Sister Linda. Look up to God. Don't look at what you are going through. Look up to God. The last time that I checked, the Lord is not here on earth. Amen? The Lord is in heaven. And so when you're not getting what you deserve, your eyesight should not only have the distant look, your eyesight needs to have the up look. And you say, Lord, I see you. I can't see you through the ceiling, but I see you. Yeah. How do I see you, Lord? The word of God tells me that you're never going to leave me. Lord, I see you. Lord, how do I see you? You're going to deal with these people that are doing me wrong. Lord, I see you. I walk not by sight. I walk by the faith side. Amen. So try at the uplook. Stop looking at what you don't have. Now hear me carefully. I, I just want to pause right here. Park my thoughts for a moment. And I just want to talk about this thought when David says delight yourself in the Lord. Because trust in the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Do this and that. You know, those are sermons in themselves. I can spend here uh, maybe a whole week or a whole month just talking about what David says. But let me just pause on delight yourself in the Lord. You know what? We delight in the fact that the check has come in, right? Yeah, right? When you have been paid at the end of the month, don't you delight? Are you not happy? You're happy, right? In fact, some of you still say, hey, Pastor, I want to take you out. <laughs> I've been paid. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. When your health is good, you delight in the Lord. When you make that 50 minute, a 10 kilo run, you delight. Are you understand what I'm saying? So we are happy when good things happen. Pastor, when your son smiles at you, you delight. Are we together? So things make us happy. And David is saying, delight yourself in the Lord. Pastor, what does that mean? Every time David used the word delight, or the Bible uses the word delight, it's always connected to the idea of abundance. Hmm? Pastor, I don't get it. Let me make you get it. In Isaiah 52, 55 verse 2, write this down. The writer says, delight yourself in abundance. Talking about the abundance of God. In Isaiah 66 verse 11, the writer also says, be delighted with a bountiful bosom. Ooh. In Psalm 37 verse 11, it says, delight themselves in abundant prosperity. And so hear me carefully. The, 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 David is making this point. God is the source of abundance. With God, there is abundance. With God, there is no lack. You are happy with getting paid? God made money. Are you, are you understand what I'm saying? 
What makes us happy is often temporary. But David is saying, with God, if there is so much abundance, he created the world. He made the earth. He made the trees. The cattle on a thousand hills is his. And so David is saying, delight in that. You don't have the promotion? That's not a problem. God can give you a promotion. Because he is the owner of promotion. He is the owner of money. He is the owner of health. He is the owner of kids. You don't have kids? Well, God can give you kids because he is the source of it. I don't know about you. I don't want to delight in my bank account because a BCA can, can go bankrupt and I can lose all my money. You know what I'm saying? I want to delight in somebody who can never go bankrupt. That is God. So my brother and my sister, hear me carefully. You need to try the outlook. Look up to God. He is a source of your abundance. Your bank account, hear me carefully, may be abundant at the beginning of the month, but after you pay the bills, it's going to be depleted. <laughs> uh-huh. Your house may be abundant with kids, but when they reach age, mothers, they will leave you with an empty nest. <laughs> hey. You don't hear me, you don't hear me, church. Your body may have abundant strength, but age will wear it away. Your voice, Pastor Sam, may have abundant strength to preach sermons, but someday you gotta rest that voice. <laughs> so abundance in this world always becomes a depleted. But the good thing is with God, there is no depletion, there is always appreciation. They say when you buy a house. And when you buy a car, the moment you drive it off the parking lot, it's depreciating. When you buy a house, when you buy a piece of land, it's always appreciating. Are you know what I'm saying? So I would rather buy land than buy a car. So when you delight in God, that's what you're doing. You're buying a house. <laughs> Something that is going to appreciate and not depreciate. And so my brother, my sister, when you're not getting what you deserve, try the outlook. Look at God. The distant look helps you to see what's going to happen, but that's not enough. You need the outlook because the outlook now allows you to live the present. The, out, the, the distant look is for the future, but the outlook is for the present. You see, not getting what you deserve is good news. Because when you're not getting what you deserve, it allows you to have the end look. Everybody say the end look. I don't hear your church. The end look. You see, the end look involves... Turning your spiritual eyes to some non-negotiables. You see, as a Christian, as a believer in God, you need to have some non-negotiables. There should be things in your life that whether hell or high water comes, whether a typhoon or a flood, whether an earthquake or a fire, you are never going to move from them. You should be so committed to certain principles in your life that no matter what, you're not going to move from them. And so the in look, hear me carefully, hear me, let me put it this way, the distant look and the up look, these are an attitude, a, a mindset, a, a perspective. That, that, that's important. But the in look involves action. Pastor, break it down. I'm going to do that. I, I, I like breaking it down. And I want you to see what David says about the in look. He says this, trust in the Lord and do good. Now here's something crazy. You are not getting your promotion. David says trust in God and do good. So doing good is not getting the promotion. You're still going to go to work. On time. Not Indonesian time. American time. You're going to go in early. And you're going to come out late. The boss says I need you to stay over. No problem. You trust in God and you do good. That's your non-negotiable. I'm not going to move from this. This is who I am as a person. I don't change because of circumstances. I live and I move in spite of the circumstances. So I do good in spite of not getting what I should be getting. Your kids don't respect you. Still give them the money that they need. Are you understand what I'm saying? Still go when they need you to see them at their play. I don't know if you, you guys go see your kids uh, play sports or uh, get involved in school. I don't know, whatever it is. But for a Christian, doing good is something that is a part of you. It's non-negotiable. 
Man, I don't understand you. That brother doesn't respect you. Why do you still call them? Man, I don't understand you. Your friends never call you. They always abuse you, but you're always there for them. That's because it's non negotiable for you to do good. Because the inlook is about me doing my part. I look at myself and I say to myself, what is it that I can do in this situation? Okay, you, you guys are not hearing what I'm saying, so I'm just going to try to, to continue to, to stress my point. But hear me carefully, my brother and my sister. Hear me carefully. David says, trust in the Lord and do good. In Hebrew, thoughts parallel each other. In other words, the writer can say one thing in one way and he'll say it in another way. So David says, trust in God and do good, but then he repeats the thought in another way. Listen to this, Sister Maria. This is what he says. He says, dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. So to trust in God is to dwell in the land and to do good is to feed on his faithfulness or a better translation will be to cultivate faithfulness. Okay, hear me, hear me carefully, church. David, no, not David, Isaac was told by God when he was having a flood, do not go to Egypt but dwell in the land. His father Abraham went to Egypt when there was a famine. But when he wants to go to Egypt, God says, ah, Isaac, I want you to dwell in the land. I don't want you to go anywhere. Oh, pastor, break it down. I'm going to break it down in a moment. Pastor, I think I need to get another job because of this uh, employer of mine is not treating me well. Perhaps God will tell you, dwell in the land. I want to go. God says, uh, oh, don't go. Dwell in the land. So to trust God is to be in the place where God has called you to be. Your workplace, your church, your family. God could be telling you, dwell in the land. I don't think I need this relationship anymore. God says, ah, uh, dwell in the land. I don't need this job, but dwell in the land. I want to get a bit of, dwell in the land. People tell me, pastor, you know, they're not treating me well. A lot of you tell me, I want to get a better job. Wanna, my brother, my sister, sometimes God is not wanting you to get a better job. God wants you to be there. Does it make sense to dwell in a place that is not giving you what you deserve? It doesn't make sense, right? Humanly, it doesn't make sense. But God sometimes puts us in situations that don't make sense. And so hear me, my brother, my sister. When God has called you to a specific place, it may not always be perfect. It's not going to be smooth. The road might sometimes be rough and rocky. But if God has called you to that place, dwell in the land. I'm not sure what your land is this afternoon. Perhaps your land is your office. Your land is your job. Your land is your family, your relationship. I don't know what your land is this afternoon. I don't know what it is, but God has called you to a specific place. Be in the land. Dwell in the land. Stay put. Don't move. Don't move. In our generation, we are so impatient. We are the microwave generation. We want everything so quick. That's why you guys like Gojek and go, go, go food. You can order everything. It's people tell me, Pastor, in Jakarta, you don't need to do nothing. You need go clean, it'll come. You need go food, it'll come. You need go pill, it'll come. That's our generation. But my brother and my sister, sometimes God will say, for you to dwell in the land, don't use go food. Cook your food. I told you, being faithful to God doesn't always equal being prosperous. But being faithful to God equals being faithful in the place where God has called you, in spite of the circumstances. So dwell in the land because it is God who keeps you, who gives you the land. I want to tell you a story. His name is Hiro Onoda. Hiro Onoda was a Japanese man. He was a soldier in the Imperial Army during, 19, during the, the Second World War. And he was sent there by the, his superiors and they were go, to go to the Philippines and, and fight and defend Japanese values and Japanese uh, territory. They, 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 they went there. But we know that the war was lost. The Japanese lost. And so the way they would spread the news that the war is over, planes would fly and flyers would be dropped. And people would read, okay, the war is over. 
Hero got the flyer. He says, nah, this cannot be true. Japan cannot lose. And so for 29 years, after the war ended, Hero stayed in the Philippines. 29 years, hiding away in the jung jungles of the Philippines. And so they discovered, the Japanese government discovered that Hero is still in the land. And so they sent people to talk to Hero. Hero, the war is over. But Hero said, no, Japan is still winning. Hero says, I'm going to dwell in this land. And so how to convince Hero? They found his commanding officer. His commanding officer had already given up his military career. He was a teacher now. They went to this man, Hero's commanding officer, and they found him. They said, uh, commanding officer, we have one of your soldiers in the jungles of the Philippines. We need him to understand the war is over. So this commanding officer left Japan, flew to the Philippines, went to where Hero was. And there this commanding officer looked at Hero in the face and says, Hero, I now relieve you of duty. You may leave this land. My brother and my sister, hear me carefully. We have a commanding officer. His name, King Jesus. If he hasn't relieved you of duty, stay in the land. Many of us, we're having difficulties and challenges because our feet, we have happy feet. We want to move everywhere. We're, we're too quick. But God simply says, stay there. The promotion is coming. The employer just wanted to see how committed you'd be. Stay there with that exercise program. You, 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 the, you have been losing fat on your organs. It's not showing on your love handles. It's not showing on your six pack. But inside, on your kidneys and your liver, it is showing. Keep running with it. No, I don't want this. I'm going to go back to my martabak and my goranga. And the guy says, no, no, no. Stay there. Stay in the land. Don't move. What land has God called you to? Stay there. Now hear me carefully. I'm getting to the end of this. David says, in this translation I'm reading, he says, feed on his faithfulness. But that's a very wrong translation because it, it means to say that when you're dwelling in the land, God is going to provide you and take care of you. He, he'll give you his faithfulness. You understand what I'm saying? But in reality, in the, the correct translation should be to cultivate faithfulness. Now, some of you, many of us, many of us, we go to Grand Lucky and we go to car four and, and these places and so we buy our lettuces and we buy our uh, some, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the name now, but we buy our vegetables. We don't know what it means to cultivate. None of us cultivate. Do you have a farm? <laughs> Maybe in the kampung, you know, I, mean, I don't know, but many of us buy our vegetables. So we may not understand what cultivating is all about. But David here wants us to understand when you cultivate something, you, 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 you find a piece of ground and you, you dig into it. You know what I'm saying? You dig into it and, and, and you take out the stones and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and you kick it out. You see the weeds, you pull them out. The dandelions, you pull them out. And so you, you, you put fertilizer and you enrich the land. When the land has been enriched and it is soft enough, then like the sower, you plant the seeds. And you, know, you plant them one by one. Maybe you, you want to make it nice and logical. One, two, three. Some of you are very OCD. One, two, three, two, three, four, five, six. You know, whatever. That don't, don't matter. But you're cultivating. You take water and you cultivate. You, 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 you pour it on that land. And then you see the blade of grass. You say, oh man, something is happening. And it grows and it grows and it grows. And so David is saying, that's what you need to do when you're in the land. Cultivate faithfulness. Clear the land. Okay, people here, don't report on time. That's going to change. I will be on time come hello high water. Even if I'm having a flu, I will go to work. I'm going to cultivate faithfulness. People don't come to church on time. That's their problem. I'm going to cultivate faithfulness. We need to have prayer in my house with my family. I will make sure that I leave work early. I'll make sure that I cut off my workout program early and I'm at home so that my kids find me there and I'm cultivating faithfulness and I'm doing what I need to do because I'm in the land that God has called me to be 
in and so my brother and my sister, when you don't get what you deserve, don't react and say, okay, I'm also going to react and, and, and show them that I'm mad at this. No, that's not the reaction. Cultivate faithfulness. Do your best. Let God do the rest. So dwell in the land. I, I'm, I'm done. Somebody could be playing. Dwell in the land. I don't know, my brother and my sister, but we need to be faithful. God's people, Christians, should be the most faithful people. You are a seven-day Adventist. You are a Christian in your office. People should know you are the guy. That Man, that guy is a good guy. If you need someone who's reliable, that's the person. When you speak at them in the wrong way, they don't flare up. They don't show their, they don't flex their argumenting muscles. They are humble. And my brother, my sister, trust me, if you keep doing that, not getting what you don't deserve is not a problem. Because you know you have the distant look, you have the up look, and you have the in look. These things churn and they move your spiritual life. The good news is, my brother, my sister, we have God. We may not get what we deserve, but we have God. We have the distant look, we have the up look, we have the end look. I don't know what struggles you're having at your workplaces, in your families. I don't know how things are, are, are for you. Maybe you can relate to what I'm saying. And you have been looking at it the wrong way. But today you say, Lord, no. Help me not to fret. Help me to have the distant look. Help me to have the up look. And help me to have the in look. I want to do things a little bit differently. It should change for me. Anybody who would like to accept the challenge? If you raise your hand, please rise to your feet and join me up here. Come on up here. Come on up here. Come here. Come here. If you raise your hand, come here. 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 But this is a special moment for you, especially because it's not easy being passed over. It's not easy being disrespected and not being appreciated. It's not easy. That's painful when you know that you deserve something. But we are being called to live a different kind of life as God's people. So let's pray. I want to pray for you. I want God to bless you. I want God to give you strength. I want God to help you in this tough moment. Because hard times are real. But God is going to help you out. Let us pray. Every head is bowed and every set of eyes is closed. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, my brothers and sisters here love you so much. And they're here every Sabbath worshiping you. They believe in you. They trust in you. But Lord, you know how hard they've been beaten up. They've been beaten up at work. They've been beaten up with their families. They're not getting what they deserve. And Father, they're, they're just having a difficult time. And we read the story of, of David in the song. And he's telling us not to worry. And he's proposing to us the distant look, the up look and the in look Father these are tough things for us to swallow but Father this is what you're calling us to and I want to pray for my brother and my sister right here Father who is standing in faith and I ask Lord that you strengthen them in this difficult moment Father you have said no good thing are you going to withhold from your loved ones and so Father whatever they need I pray Lord you provide it because you definitely love to see us get what we deserve. And so, Father, I really pray that you could provide what they need. Money, health, whatever it is, Father. I don't know. I can't even think of it right now. But you know exactly what they need. So I just pray, Father, that in you they may get what they deserve. But, Father, if at all that they're not getting it yet, may they never question their relationship with you because you are ever faithful and ever by them. And so, Father, into your hands I pray, committing them, trusting in you. And Lord, may you come through for them. This is my prayer in Jesus' name.